with some um, some materials. Um, and somehow my my slides have. Uh, oh, I see what the problem is. It looks like. Okay. Um, yeah. 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 Okay. The problem is that we have a. Uh, mismatch between uh, the local resolution and the screen. So we'll just have to bear with this. I, I don't think it should be debilitating. Um, I'll, I'll work this out for next time with the native resolutions. I said 371. This is not 371. Yes, quite John. Is there still office hours here after? Uh, there in my office. Uh, although I guess I could, let's see if the room's empty. It would be better here if possible. Otherwise, we can go up to my office and I'm not going to physically hold them in my office. What I'll do is hold them in the lab where there's more space for people, people can social distance. Okay. So I have uh, my 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 uh, office is in my lab. Um it's adjoining my lab, and there's a big open area there we can meet if there's questions. But if this room is open, we can just turn. We'll we'll sit. I, I just don't know. Um okay. Um so uh, first of all, I want to note that um, I posted to the campus site links to two ABM tutorials, which I delivered um, in the past two weeks. Okay, um, uh, you'll find them on campus, and I posted a link to one of them before or at the time of our last office hours. So I think. But if you haven't watched them, I'd like you to. What these tutorials are about is is step by step uh, guidance on building some simple any logic uh, each based model. Okay, and we don't have time for this class to be a training class where I train you on click here, do this, at that, you know, drag this in from the palette. There's a room. There's room for that. I actually teach that professionally worldwide as one of the one of the things I teach, but um, but you'll find these videos cover that, and I delivered them two weeks ago. And the materials will get you up to speed of building models in any logic um, for agent-based modeling. You will need that for either assignments or projects, very likely, and so it's good material to, to get exposed to. If you're already familiar with it, you can fast forward through it. That's fine. But um, please do that because I'll be touching on those skills. For your assignments and for some of the exercises we undertake in class. Okay. So so try to watch those with them, you know, by this time next week. Okay. Um and uh, in general, I'm gonna start asking you to watch some 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 additional videos. So ladies and gentlemen, when we broke broke for uh reading week, we um have left off. Uh, with infectious disease modeling with stocks and flows. And we had learned some principles there that are that are universal. Um, principles involving the basic reproductive number, the effect of reproductive number, the nature of the dynamics of infection spread, if it's an open population or a closed population, a closed population being one with no people coming in and no people leaving. And an open population being, for example, people are coming in, maybe it's babies being born or whatever. Um, and we also explored stock and flow dynamics, and we saw it was really useful for reasoning about why the number of infectious people is going up at any one time. So when it turns around, we had used different lenses, like reasoning about the number of people of given infective infects before they recover. That's he called the what? What's the number of people that are given infected infects before they recover? It's actually given a name. Speak on bigger skews. <laughs> yes, it's the effective reproductive number. R0 is actually the basic, very close. Uh, basic reproductive number is the effective reproductive number in one very special case. It's the e. The basic reproductive number is the effective reproductive number of everyone around is susceptible. That's the number of people that will affect if 
everyone around them is susceptible. Um, that's the basic reproductive number. Um, but the effective reproductive number is in any situation. And when that is one, they're just replacing themselves with a single infected. Remember that? I know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, it, it's good to remind yourself. Yeah. Um, and all those principles will carry over for this new module on any phase following. And in fact, we'll be using mechanisms that are kind of reminiscent of it. So, um, here we have a stock of flow model, right? We have susceptibles, exposed, infected, and recovered, right? Uh, the population at any one time is divided up into these stocks, right? And these stocks count the number of people who are at any one time susceptible, exposed, infected, or recovered, right? At any one time, if we froze time, there'd be a certain number of susceptible, a certain number exposed, a certain number infected, a certain number recovered. So that's, and this illustrates the progression, right? The structure illustrates the progression. A, a model like this, you sometimes hear people say, you know, garbage in, garbage out, and models nothing more than the data. Sorry, nonsense. Models a lot more than the data. It's the structure. And the structure is actually more foundational than the data. What things are connected to what is actually the more important thing, how they're connected together. That's the structure of the system. And we saw that structure drove behavior. It can be a big difference if there's a way in the community or not, for example. Totally big difference, right? Um, okay. But over here, we're graduating to this type of system over here on the left. Susceptible, exposed, infected, recover. Um, it looks all the world like this one over here. Same basic pattern. Okay, it's yellow instead of gray, but the basic connectivity is, is very similar, right? We have susceptibles, susceptibles. We have exposed, exposed. We have infectious, infectious. We have recovered, recovered. There's this progression among them, and then we have this waning of immunity. And at a certain level, they look like just the same thing with different colors and, and different conventions for laying it up. You can be excused for thinking, wait, this is basically the same thing. Potato, potato, tomato, tomato. It's just another name for the same thing. You can be excused for that, but you'd be mistaken. And this lecture is going to try to develop some understanding about why you'd be mistaken um, in agent based modeling. Um, so, with agent based modeling, you recall, that we have one or more populations of individual agents. So we have we have groupings, population, and maybe one, it might be several. They might be two populations of people, Saskatoon and Regina. And they might be populations of people and populations of support dogs. They might be deer and people. They might be birds and mosquitoes and people. Um, uh, work with models of, of all of those. Um, although in Saskatchewan, it's better to work on an aggregate model of mosquitoes because trying to represent all of them as agents would be, be a little bit small. Um, but we have multiple populations, and each of those populations is individuated. It's, it's single agents, right? Um, and each agent can have dynamics represented in this construct called a state chart. So the state chart is going to represent for a given concern, say here infection, for this particular person, what's their situation right now? What's their state right now with respect to that concern? Are they susceptible right now or exposed or infected or recovered? There are exactly one of these simple states that has one time. And over time, they were evolved between them. That single person. Oops, kind of different than here, right? Where we have counts of people. But you might be wondering, like, yeah, okay, it's 
different in that, but isn't this just the sum up of this over many people? Well, we'll, we'll talk about that. Um, so um, one of the differences here has to do with a variety of ways that we can characterize transitions. So over here, we were dealing with transitions that were mostly what are called first order delays. Stop whose chance of leaving per unit time very proportionally, it was just some constant times the number of people in the stock, right? So if there were if there were a thousand people in, who were infectious, there'd be more people recovering per day than if there was one person infected or zero person infected. There's no one infectious, nobody would recover. So in general, this outflow Dependent linearly on this, which just a constant time set. Do you remember that? You explored that in your, your, your first assignment. So, right? Okay. Okay. So, um, we had basically that mechanism. Some of these had more mechanism, right? Like this infectious transition. Remember, we had C times I over N times beta times S in this complicated thing. But it was still ultimately some chance per unit time of leaving the state. And we call that chance per unit time of, of getting infected that a given susceptible has to get infected. That probability per unit time that susceptible will get infected. We call it, we gave it a name. What is that name? A rate. It's a rate. Indeed, it's a rate. And what is the rate called? Force of infection. I, I heard it whispered in the ranks, and that's great. Okay, um, but with with a with a set of state charts, we have differences. Um, and maybe I'll make this point because it's not in a slide, but I want you to understand it. One of the ways these are similar is that in both cases, this diagram, in both cases, each of these diagrams encodes three big things. What three things does it encode? A set of possible states that the system could be in, um, or that a given person could be in. That's that's characterized here, right? Um, it depicts basically the state of the system with respect to this concern here, but the state of the system. You can be in this state, this state, this state, or that state. And this is the state of the system over here on the right. So it's the state of the system, okay. It depicts actions that change that state. Variously, these flows. Those are, remember, stop and plug in those, are, those are the verbs, the, the kind of the stops of the nouns and the flows of the verbs. That's where the action is. That's what drives the value of the stops, right? Um, so we have state. We have actions that change the state, and we have rules that govern those actions that change the state. So we have a different rule, different formula for force of infection than we do for, for sort of uh, leaving latency getting infectious or for recovery. Okay, so we have different rules. And in an age-based model, we have more types of, of rules. We have, we have, you see these little icons. Those are different, different semantics. The, this icon with a little declining exponential curve means something to the difference in this time, this clock, or then this message. And let's go look at that. So the types of transitions that are common in any logic, and you'll find some similar types in some other packages, are a fixed rate. This is actually very similar to the first order delays. Um, that we have been in, in stock and flow models. You have a chance for unit time of leave. It's called a hazard rate. I got like a 10% chance per day of leave. And it's applied continuously. It's not just in the course of the day, I, you know, at the end of the day, I flip a coin, did I leave a 10%? No, no, no. It's continuously applied. It's like, as someone said, it's like continuously accrued interest. It's just continuously applied. Uh, if I didn't go this millisecond, I might go the next. 
but the shorter and shorter period of time you look at, the less and less camps uh, uh, within that little interval that really, okay. So there's a fixed rate, there's a timeout. You're leaving exactly a certain amount of time. That's, that's this one here. This is a timeout. This is a rate, this is a timeout here. I should, um, I'll try to do it with two hands. This is a rate, this is a timeout. And then uh, this is another rate down here. And then we have this. This is a message transition. This is indicating an asynchronous transition. Um, a situation where there's something else in the model that triggers it kind of at an arbitrary time. And it triggers it by sending it a, anyone want to guess? A message. Indeed, hence a, hence a little influence. Um, so, so this is uh, a message uh, triggered transition. You can also have a predicate. You can, you can actually have a transition if the condition is true or false. This can be a bit expensive because it has to come from a lot. Boom, boom, boom. But, but you know, it, it could monitor a situation that if the, you know, if the hospitalization, if, if the uh, number of cases reaches a certain threshold, you'll activate surge capacity in the hospital or something like that. Um, uh, it can also be triggered by an arrival. We'll see agent-based lot modeling allows mobility of agents. They can move around the space and you can trigger it there and you can have it depend on a, a variable rate. Um, now, I'm not going to provide all of these. I'm, I'm, this is not a training course. Um, you will find probably a thousand plus videos of, of me teaching this from a training perspective. It's actually probably upwards of 2,000 online. So um, if you don't mind hearing my voice, uh, you, can, you can go and, and find many training videos. But the ones I, I asked you to watch, those are pretty good at getting you started. Um, so, so rates and flows um, are very similar. These sort of rates that we have associated with transition um, are basically similar to flows in the sense it's a chance per unit time of leaving here. In a stop and flow model, that depends on some constant, and similarly, you'll have a, a constant here. So when you have a rate, you'll specify what the rate is. And this could be a fixed number or it could be a variable number, a, a variable. A thing that changes over time or changes based on uh, your presence in another state, et cetera. Um, okay. Um, right. Um, here, we have to realize that we're dealing with a situation that an individual who's in one state, they're in, remember a state chart says for that particular person, what state they're in. And so this is a probability per unit time that they will leave. Um, in a stop and flow model, we always had the number of people leaving the flow out being proportional to the stop. Again, if there were a thousand people in the stop, a lot more would leave than zero or zero or zero would leave. That was that was typically done. But here we're just giving a probability the person will leave the, the, the state. Right? That's that's what that is. It's a probability per unit time that they will leave this state. And if, and you'll have to say what the time unit of the model is. If it's this day, they have one percent chance per day. Week. Simple idea should carry over very well from a stock and flow model. So I'm not gonna I'm not gonna dwell on it. But you know, others are these timeout transitions. So there are certain things that proceed at fixed rates. You know, a, an agent, the time of the semester, uh, the the duration of a pregnancy. You might draw it from the distribution, but after that. It, you know, it occurs at a, at a certain time. It's not a certain chance for a time of leaving. That wouldn't be a good way of representing it because it's tightly clustered around nine months. Um, so, uh, you know, you can you can have time constants that might be drawn from a distribution and then it will leave after that amount of time. I'm giving you some hints that you might want to use in your, in your model. Um, sometimes we have self-transitions. So a transition like this, and for those working with any logic in your assignments or in your projects, which is pretty much everyone, you should realize that these self-transitions 
can occur either coming out of a state and going back in. That's what this represents. They actually leave the state and come back in. Or it can just be inside the state um, and you're never leaving. It's just it's firing off and doing something. Why would you do that? Well, each state, um, each of these transitions is associated with an action. So in general, an action, there's an action bit of code here you can put. When the transition fires, an action happens. That action might be as simple as logging something, you know, logging some information to, uh, to a file or, or to the console saying, I'm alive, or, you know, I got infected, or something like that. Um, or it might be something more significant, like sending another agent a message. We can have conditional transitions, which are conditional on a certain predicate being true. So this is different from a conditional transition. This is a, a sort of, uh, uh, this is a, a situation where we actually have a branch here. And you could say the branch uh, is undertaken under this condition. And so that will allow you to say, you know, someone's exposed to infection, so I'm near someone on the bus, and they cough, and, and I or they're breathing aerosols out. Am I infected? And if so, do I go to primary progression? This is TB, or do I go on and, and just have latent TB for potentially decades? And I, I don't, I don't develop really uh, serious TB in the short term. Um, and you can have exit points. This would be for something like death. You can have a you can have someone go to a sink where they never come out of the state, and in general, that agent will be removed. So just be aware the language of agents is pretty broad here. Stops and flows, ladies and gentlemen, uh, are, are, you know, uh, have a much smaller vocabulary. We build things that stops, flows, and then we have dynamic variables and parameters, uh, uh, you know, to represent constants. Uh, but it's, it's a pretty limited vocabulary. Not, when I say limited, I don't mean it's constrictive necessarily. It's just very small vocabulary, very small alphabet. Here we have a much bigger alphabet. We have a lot of different things we can add together. Um, okay, so we have self transitions. Okay, but I, I want to come back to the subsidiary. So I taught you kind of some of what you can do with with these types of uh, state charts, and that's all nice. And you can see there's general rules and those didn't exist for stocks and flows, right? I've been talking about these different types of rules for transitions, of timeout, of range, of message transition, arrival transition, additional transition. Um, but, and, and those didn't exist in stocks and flows, right? Stocks and flows, you basically, gave a rule for the flow in terms of a format, right? Yes, yes, that's fine. You and your name? Uh, Jake. Jake, yes. Um, so you showed the slide about an exit point. I'm wondering what's the like, benefit between using an exit point for that versus having a space to jump into? Well, it's a, good, it's a good question. This communicates a little bit more intention. Um, so, Building these bonds, the um, all computational is software engineering. And one of the tragedies of modeling is that most people who build models are not trained in software engineering. And you get quite horrendous things coming out. <laughs> I could go on for hours about that. Um, uh, but, um, a lot of the principles of software engineering, good software development practices, good uh, software engineering uh, practices carry over to models. And one of them is you want things that are intentional revealing. Um, you want things which, when you when you uh, when you uh, in your code or in a modeling framework like this, you put it there. It's obvious to someone who sees it what you mean. So you use good naming conventions and code, right? So we, we use a naming convention that communicates our meaning. Um, that's really important. If you have variables like with names like A, B, C, 
X, Y, you're missing, you're missing a lot of opportunities there um, to communicate, communicate with someone else or communicate with yourself six months from now. You're, you're missing the ability to sort of quickly have someone look at it and see what you need. Um, and a, 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 a situation like this where you can exit is a very clear indication that this is a final state that you will not leave from and it's typically associated with the person or the agent disappearing. And so it just has a little bit more semantics than a and trapping state where there's no exit from it like this. Um, uh, it's just, it's a little bit clearer visually what is meant. Um, uh, there's a, one other point that I'll mention, uh, which also bears on this. This is a little bit of an esoteric thing. But if you have multiple state charts, they can share an exit. So, so multiple state charts will often each make use of the same exit and it, it communicates that the exit is something about the whole individual it's not something about on a per state chart base whereas a given state will be on a per state chart base we're going to get to that okay so those are two reasons one more from a software engineering perspective and one from the perspective of uh of kind of uh uh how uh, what it allows, and it's part of the language of these state charts that that exits are shared between state charts. Okay, great question. Any other questions about that? I want to want to get back um, to this, this issue of similarity and differences. So before the break, um, actually, I think it was in my opening remarks um, on this some weeks ago. I talked about aggregate models and agent based models. Um, and within aggregate models, we're sub again, I, I tried to give you a way of thinking about this. The model is organized by state, it's divided up into stocks, susceptible, exposed, infected, recovered. Um, and people are in a different state depending on what they're situation is right if they're susceptible they're in this state if they're in, in exposed they're in that state etc um if we have to keep track of um susceptible exposed infected recovered in males uh and females um we will do so by uh by actually needing to make a copy of the whole model so we would have Maybe, maybe we have an SEIR model here. I'm, I'm drawing it on the board for those who are attending remotely, and I'm going to angle my camera to this. So here we have SEIR. And if we wanted to, and you know, there's some mixing up here with total population and uh, mumble mumble, um, and, and it comes back down at least to a factor, blah, blah, blah. Um, we can do this for the whole population, but if we wanted to, to keep track of the number of men and women who are infected, maybe, maybe there's differences in the practices as far as contact or as far as probability of transmission per exposure, um, et cetera, or, or in terms of likelihood of going and getting tested if they are ill. Um, what we would do is you'd actually need to copy. We'd have a version of this for men uh, susceptible males, uh, exposed males, uh, infected males, recovered males, and then we have susceptible female, exposed female, infected female, recovered female, and we would have mixing between them, so males could interact with females and vice versa, but we would, um, okay, I've got, I can't update too much here, um, but we would need to make a copy of this model. So if we need to distinguish men and women, we need to make a copy. And once again, the subdivision is according to the state characteristic. We, it's organized according to um, the, the characteristics of a person in a current state. Is that pretty clear to people? Like they're in a different box depending on their state. It's organized by that principle. Okay. And each stock counts the number of people in that group, right? So each stock is associated with a group of susceptible males. 
or infected females, right? Yeah. Okay. So just to follow, for you to follow along. Now, um, if we have different cities, for example, we might have SEIR for, for Saskatoon and then SEIR for, for Regina, right? Um, we might have males in Saskatoon, ma females in Saskatoon, males in Regina, females in Regina. Okay. Um, uh, and um, I think, you know, we, like the relationships between things, between males and females is in some sort of mixing and in general, some mixing matrix. It says, how much do, does this group mix with this other group? So um, organization is by characteristics and state. And each unit of that organization counts the number of people in that state. Okay. In agent-based modeling, it's subdivided. It's organized by people, by individuals. And each individual maintains its own attributes, their state their characteristics. Um, and um, if we have relationships between these, like uh, this given agent is within Saskatoon, we'd actually might have a Saskatoon, a city agent, and Saskatoon would be an instance of that. Regina would be another instance. And individuals would circulate in a city agent. And that city agent can be in a province agent. And they serve the cities are in the province and they're connected in a network that's geographic or what have you. Um, so here for agent based modeling, we're organizing the model not by state and characteristic, we're organizing by person, and each person keeps track of their state and their characteristics. Do you see why it's, it's, it's kind of flipped with stock and flow model? It's organized by state and characteristics, and each unit of it counts the number in there. With an agent-based model, it's organized by person and or by agent, and each agent keeps track of their characteristics and state. Okay, now this is going to matter a great deal. Um, in stocks and flows, um, uh, we're going to have a subdivision of the population according to a uh, discrete state, but with with um, state charts, um, we're out of a discrete division, susceptible, exposed, infected, covered. Um, but each state chart is going to have one active state, and it generally can have more than one state chart. Um, and we can actually keep track of how long they've been in there. I'd like to give this example in terms of headers. I created this right before class because I didn't feel that the slides connected quite well. So here we have a heterogeneous situation. We have two dimensions of heterogeneity. Anyone want to say what those dimensions are? What are the dimensions of heterogeneity? How do these things differ from each other? Anyone? They differ in what and what? Color and shape. Good. Excellent. So we have this population. They different color and shape, right? Um, you can choose what color is, you can choose what shape is. Maybe shape is whether you're born in Canada or not, and maybe color is, you know, whether you have finished university or not, or whether you're older than 20 or whatever. Um, so kind of abstracting over that, we have some population. Um, these, are, these are individual things. Um, now, we could, take that and group things together visually that are kind of in the same bin, right? So we could take all the green squares and we could put them in one bin. And we could take all the red squares and put them in a bin and all the green, the red circles and put them in a bin and similarly here, right? And then we could just count the number in each of them, right? And I would argue that this count up of the number that have a certain characteristics, green squares, red circles, whatever. Counting that up gives a total summary of this population. Uh, I'm, I'm ignoring space, of course, and I'm pretending that doesn't matter. If all I care about is shape and color, this is a complete summary of that population. 
should be pretty clear to people. This count summarizes this population. Okay. Um, I want to ask, does this count, these two counts summarize the entire population? So on the one side, we count the number of, oh, sorry, this should be, <laughs> that certainly does not. Square and circle um, uh, here, we have uh, five uh, squares and we have four circles. And then it was meant to be green and then red up here. And let me, let me fix that up. Uh, green and red here. Uh, and we will have green, there will be five indeed. And red, there'll be four. Yeah, so that actually is true. Does this completely specify the population? Why not? What is it missing? The correlation. Exactly. We're not keeping track. Okay, so we know there are five green things, but are those five green things all squares? For example. Or are they some squares and some circles? This, this doesn't tell us, right? Um, and these red things that are the four of them, okay? We know there are four red things. We, we don't know if they're all, all the circles or, again, some of them are squares. We, we lose the relationship between them, the, the association between them, the, the correlation between them. This isn't enough to tell us, right? Okay, now I want to get to what is what is this? What does this have to do with state terms? It has everything to do with state terms. If we have a stock and flow model and we want to keep track of more than one thing, maybe we want to keep track. I have diabetes and kidney disease here. But imagine instead we want SCIR for COVID-19 versus SCIR for flu, right? Um, so maybe we have S, uh, SCIR for flu. So, so I'm gonna put in S sub C, E sub C, I sub C, and R sub C for COVID-19 status, and S sub I for influenza. Maybe I should do F for flu, but E for, maybe I'll do F because I is confusing, it's already used, right? So here we go. A couple of years ago, I got the award for the most steps run in class. Um, so here we go. I think actually uh, I, I beat out everyone else by back about 10. Um, but uh, here's flu, here's, here's for COVID-19, right? Um, does this, so we could have them all like this, right? Flu people could get flu. Uh, COVID-19 people could, get, could transmit COVID. What is this missing? If we have these two things separate, what are, what are they missing? Yeah, so it's okay. yeah and, it, and so it's not telling you how many people there are that are susceptible for both. How many people are there who are susceptible for COVID but have recovered from flu? How many of them that are there that are infected for both right now? Right? It doesn't tell you that. It just tells you it's it's kind of like like this, it tells you the number with respect to each of these, and it tells you the number with respect to each of these, but not, not for both. So here I would tell you the number of diabetes right now, or the number of early stage kidney disease, but it doesn't tell you are they kind of the, is it the, is it the people who hear of chronic diabetes? Are those the people who have, you know, predominantly proteinuria or are they earlier? And in general, if we want to track that information and stop the flow model, horrible things happen. Horrible things happen. We get this entangling between them. So what would we need to do here? So I, I kind of shown we get this combinatorial flow. We have to keep track of all combination of states. So what would I have to do for COVID and influenza here? Anyone? What would I have to do for COVID and influenza? If I wanted to keep track of COVID, you know, the number of people that are each that are susceptible for COVID and are recovered for influenza or infected with both or are exposed to flu and, and recovered from COVID. What would I need to do? 
Anyone say? Yes. Right. And your name? Uh, Kenneth. Kenneth, yes. Um, you would need a copy of the population within both models? Yeah. Yeah. So what I would need to do would be to create, I'll do it over here for equity sake. That's okay. Yeah. Um, so I would need to do something horrible. Don't, don't, yes. A good, good call. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, that's, that's great. I probably should get a telescope for my uh, laptop too. Um, okay, great. Uh, so S E I R, and so this would be for for COVID, right? And then we have. And this would be though not just COVID, right? We'd have to do susceptible for COVID and susceptible for flu. And this would be exposed for COVID and susceptible for flu. And this would be exposed or infected for COVID and susceptible for flu. And this would be recovered for COVID and susceptible for flu. And guess what will go down this axis? Anyone? It's horrible. How many rows are there going to be? Anyone? Where am I going with this? What's this X down here? Um, actually, it's just, just four, but um, it's going to be 16 combinations. This way, it's going to be progressing for flu. I'm not going to draw it out. It, this is horrible enough. My handwriting isn't going to work. That's like the full horror. And if you don't want to see that video, um, you've been spared that by the digital, digital, uh, uh, digital uh, uh, interaction. Okay, so you get something like this. So when I see this, it almost makes me feel physically sick because they're so entangled in a needless way. There's a there's a structure here that's very simple, but it's being weirdly sort of blown up in this combinatorial web. We're dealing with all possibilities. Now imagine that we have to add another state. You know, our, our, our system stakeholder says, I'd like you to keep track and distinguish, in fact, early stage COVID infection from late stage, because it's late stage you'd have to go to the hospital. Then what would you have to do? You'd have to do what? You have to modify this whole thing, like all of these. So it's, it's quite horrendous, uh, this, this comment for a blow up. And it belies the fact that we have this simple inherent structure of things that's, that's getting lost. It's full of sound and fury and it signifies, you know, comparatively little. It's, it's like blown up needlessly large. And in general, we're, we'd like to have models that are reasonably rich. We'd like to be able to deal with, you know, the COVID, the effects of, COVID-19 on mental health. And so we want a mental health status and a COVID-19 status. Or we want to deal with the fact that people who have um, uh, you know, some underlying, underlying condition, let's say uh, serious renal disease or a greater risk of COVID-19. Um, we'd like to be able to keep track of several of these things without, without blowing up our model here. Remember, the reason we needed this, this hideous division for a stop and flow model is the model is organized by, by state and characteristics. That's what divides it up. And we have to keep track of every combination to come to the number of people on that combination. With a, with a, with a state chart, each state chart is in exactly at any one time with respect to a given state chart, it's in exactly one state. So you can keep track of their TB status with this one, tobacco use with this one, diabetes with that one. And there's no combinatorial blow up. You don't have to consider all combinations because at any one time you're in one state of one or another state of another. And they can inter but they can talk to each other. Uh, it's just that for the most, you don't have to describe them in an entangled way. So this is really powerful, actually. It's really important. This harks back to another software engineering principle. The principle, ladies and gentlemen, of separation. We want, when we build our programs, to be able to put different types of concerns in different places in the program. 
So when we, because programs are complex entities, programs get really large and sometimes confusing. And if everything is tangled together in a hairball, then it's complicated for us to deal with this and to think about it, it's debug it, and change it, evolve it, extend it. But if we can parcel out that complexity into different pieces, if instead of it being tangled together in a hideous sort of way, it's separated out and parceled out in pieces where different parties can work on different ones of these. We can modify one without having to modify everything. Here, you know, to modify COVID, we have to go get mucked up with, with representing all the parts of, of, of influenza and modify all the entanglements. Here, they're separated out neatly. We can modify things in a crisp way. So in general, we're going to have separation of concerns be possible with state charts because you're in exactly one state. For each state chart, at any one time, you're in exactly one state. Mm -hmm. And and so this state chart, I'm maybe an exposed state chart. This one, I'm not open to seeking care. Maybe there's some interaction between them, right? Maybe my my infection status ends up affecting my openness to seeking care. That's fine. We can surgically define that, but we don't have to deal with all the entanglement stuff them because we're in exactly one state with respect to each. Ladies and gentlemen, it's very much like dealing with this, the individuals, rather than dealing with these summaries. This, ladies and gentlemen, this table on the right, is like this hideous summary. We have to deal with all combinations of them. We can list them out, but it's pretty brutal. We have to deal with all combinations. And imagine if instead of two colors, you had 100 colors. And instead of you know two shapes, you had 30 shapes. Then this table will grow hideous and you know might frighten young children um as well as might me but um and, and so it is with with stock and flow models we have to deal with all combinations in agent-based modeling this is this is what we're dealing with we're representing each individual and all their characteristics and we don't have to worry that we either lose the information by just summarizing the marginal distribution, as these are called, the sort of division of red and green and losing, keep losing track of which ones or those have what, what uh, shapes. Um, and we don't have to consider all combinations. Those are the two horrible out outcomes that come about with, with aggregate models. Okay, um, so there are some other advantages. So I'll just note, Another big advantage of this sort of modeling is that you can keep track of, for example, um, how long someone has been in a given state and have their chance of leaving depend on how long they've been in the state. One of the things about smoking, for example, is you know a lot of people who smoke try to quit. The truth is it's a, it's a sad thing, but if you look up and there's many quit attempts per year, people fall back. But the longer they can manage to stay quick, actually, the, the lower the chances per month they'll fall back. So, like, if they can go for longer, they're less likely to fall back. If they go another year yet, they're less likely in the next month to fall back, and a lot less likely than they were in the first month after quitting. And you can represent that really nicely here. Whereas in a stock and flow model, you can't. Actually, your chance per unit time of leaving is independent of how long you've been there. That's it's it's we say the stock is well mixed. We 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 can't say someone who's been in the stock for longer in a stock and flow model is more likely to leave. It just it's just considered anyone who's in that stock, uh, this they have this chance for unit time of leave. Another nice advantage from a software engineering perspective of state charts is we can have hierarchical state charts. You can see them here. Um, these are state charts where this is kind of a, it's a poor example of it, but um, you can have states within other states. And it's, it actually affords us a chance to kind of group together transitions out that apply to multiple internal states. 
and it can be really useful. This is from some of our modeling for um, uh, substance use issues. And here, you know, we have uh, certain larger states, like someone being a current user and former user within that state. There, there are several substates, and for any one of those, they can leave, and so you don't have to repeat these for the substate. So this is sort of hierarchy that can apply, which is actually rather rather um, elegant uh, in terms of what you can represent. So look, you can keep track of the simultaneous state of a single individual with an individual based model. Remember those squares and circles? Remember the red and green? Then we can actually keep track simultaneously of their shape and their color, not just through consideration of the fall horror of all combinations, and not just by being unable to relate who's in one state to who's in another state. We can keep track of what they're in simultaneously in multiple states. Keep track of heterogeneity. We can capture different chances of leaving per unit time based on how long they've been there. And we can associate history information with them. Um, their chance of leaving over time can depend on how long they've been there, but they're additionally, the, uh, along the way, we can keep track what's their history been. And that's not something you could do in a stock and flow model. If you have a stock and flow model, like what we saw here, we can't ask, are the people who are infected now infectious now? The same people who are infectious a year ago? We don't have a language for doing that. In fact, in general, we, we can't do that. We it just counts the number, right? So we can't say there's 100 people in Texas now. We can know that. Maybe a year ago there were 100 people, but are they the same 100? Can't ask. It's, it's just not in the nature of things to be able to ask that for this sort of model. It gives a, a picture at any one time what's true without keeping track of individuals. In this sort of model, to the left, we can keep easy track. And you'll see that in the in the models I you built up on that uh, video. Please follow along and build some up. Uh, as you follow that, you'll actually keep track of the number of times they've been infected, and that's really useful um, to keep track of their history. That's not possible with this. So, ladies and gentlemen, we began this class our first together, looking at this question of. You know, to what degree do we have similarities between these ways of describing dynamics? And to what degree are they different? And we saw a number of lines of similarities at a broad level are characterizing state and actions that change state, the rules are changing at once. We're characterizing the structure of the system at once. These are both dynamic models, and they're both close cousins in that regard. But there's big differences that are not obvious here. And they go beyond the color or the fact that these are small lines and these are big ones. So they have to do with heterogeneity, the ability to capture distinctions, the ability to capture how long you've been in a given state, the ability to capture history information, the ability to represent different types of transitions that are not merely rate transitions like they are here, but these transitions like timeouts. Like, like message based transition when something happens, you know, undertake action or what have you, arrival transition. So don't be fooled into thinking these are the same. They're actually, they have some similarities, but there are really important differences. And in the coming lectures, we'll be exploring some of those differences, taking advantage of them. And hopefully you'll come out of this with an, a renewed appreciation for you know, the, the sort of natural mode of application of each of these modeling methods. Okay. Um, and in our final lectures, we'll be exploring how they project the mind, because these are not solitude. We'll see that actually you can combine these two in formidable ways to get something where the whole is greater than the sum of the parts, but that will come later. First, we need to learn this language. Okay, so that's all for today. It's been a great pleasure to see you in person. And we'll see if this room is soon swamped by another class. If not, I look forward to engaging with you here. And if, if it is swamped, 
will retreat to uh, my lab and we can talk there because that's how I do uh, my office. So thank you so much. And for those who are remote, uh, I'll work to try to um, include you further in some board behavior here. We're limited by a cord for both power and another for video, but hopefully uh, I'll be able to refine my board habits so that we can uh, include you in the, the board. I'll take photos of each thing on the board so you can see them in the slides that I post to the campus site. Okay, so I'm going to stop my screen sharing and stop my recording.